Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Paradigm Press News Channel on YouTube. Uh, my name is Sean Ring. I'm the editor of The Root Awakening, and I have the pleasure today of uh, joining my friends and colleagues. Uh, we've got Byron King, who uh, writes for pretty much every publication we have and is our resident professor in Gandalf the Grey. Uh, we have Dan Amos, who writes for uh, Jim Rickards and is one of his chief analysts, in fact, is his chief analyst. Uh, and then we've got the banker, Zach Scheidt, who uh, runs the Lifetime Income Report and also writes for Jim. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Great to see you. The reason why we all have gathered is because, uh, one, we like to welcome a bunch of new subscribers. So everyone who's new to the channel, thank you very much uh, for your support and for your um, you know, interest in trying us out. We are going to do everything we can to justify uh, your confidence in us. Um, and also to our old subscribers, we absolutely love you and we're always here to serve you. So thank you for rejoining us and for watching. Um, Obviously, gold's on our mind, um, and it has been glittering along with silver, which uh, I, I think I'm probably the greediest of us all, so I'll talk a little bit about silver later. Uh, but mm -hmm. let me open this up uh, and, and hand it over to, to Byron for a second. Byron, uh, Byron, you've got every trick in the book, every prop. Uh, you've been around the world. We've been talking about this for a while. Long-term mm -hmm. cycles. It looks like it's finally here. What's your take on it right now? Well, thank you, Sean, th and my colleagues. Thank you, everybody who's watching. Again, like Sean said, we really appreciate that you would, you know, give us your time and, and put your trust in us to, you know, send your newsletters and emails and whatever. We're we're do the best we can to help you out here. If you're if you've been around for a while, or if you are brand new to the franchise, whatever, welcome. We are going to talk about gold, mostly gold, silver, precious metals, hard assets. Uh, inflation is out there. You know the story, $35 trillion in national debt. I just saw this thing the other day that last year, fiscal year 2024, the U.S. federal government total outlays were $6.8 uh, trillion with a T, trillion dollars, $6.8 trillion to, 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 to give us our democracy here. And of that 6.8 T, 1.8 T was borrowed money. We had a 1.8 trillion national you know, debt or de deficit last year, yes. which is just added to the national debt, on which we pay interest, et cetera. 1.8 trillion, it, it just by size, take the Defense Department times two, okay? And you're kind of in the, you're in the ballpark there. So that we spent that, we don't have that money. We borrowed it. If we didn't borrow it, the Fed, you know, printed it. And so we have inflation. You talk about, oh, the price of bacon, the price of gas, whatever. Yeah, uh, and, and the price of bacon is going up and the price of gasoline and the price of, a loaf of bread. I mean, six, seven bucks for a loaf of bread at the store. So I'm, I mean, sticker shock for people. Uh, you asked for props. This is a Hershey bar. I went, I went, I stopped at the gas station yesterday to uh, 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 to get gas, and I knew we had this call. And I thought, I thought, I, I, I want to illustrate this. This is a Hershey bar. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when you could buy one of these things for ten cents. Okay. Yesterday at the Seven Eleven, and I, just the Seven Eleven. You've got them. They're everywhere. They're around the world. So this thing was almost two dollars. I think it was a buck ninety-five or something like that. And you can say, "Well, I could buy it cheap." No, if they were charging twenty times the price of what it used to be a long time ago. So this ten-cent Hershey bar is now a two-dollar Hershey bar uh, at, at the Seven Eleven. That's inflation over the course of your life. Look at your house. Look at rent. Look at college tuition. The dollar purchasing power is shrinking. And when we say the price of gold is going up, the price of gold is going up. The gold hasn't changed one bit. Every atom, every molecule, every neutron and proton and electron in that gold is the same as it was long ago, billions of years ago when it formed in the core of a neutron star. You know, um, uh, it's the value of the U.S. dollar that, is, that, is, that has gone down, you know, and I, you know, props and such. This is this is a five ounce gold ingot here. Uh, it was minted probably about. 98, 90, 100 years ago on the back of, you know, the Republic National Bank, you can sort of read, read that, but, you know, I don't, I don't want to you know, bore you with it, but this is five ounces of gold right here. And if gold is, let's say, $2,600 an ounce, you know, do the math, you know, this little, this little thing here, which is about the size of my thumb, this is $13,000 worth of just plain gold right now, you know, now when I'm finished, it's going back it's going off site to a vault because I don't keep this stuff around the house. You know, don't bother coming around. But, uh, uh, but, but I knew we had this 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 show here. You know, and, and in the olden days, banks used to actually, you know, 
put their names and their marks on gold because banks dealt with gold. You know, and like here's here's another one. This is Republic Bank. This is also Republic Bank. This is five ounces of silver. It's a different size because silver is a different density than gold. Gold is denser than silver. So, but but they are about the same thickness. You know, but but the the silver is just bigger. But so the banks used to used to trade in these things, and the banks used to back up their banking with real live gold. Well, you know, we don't we don't worry about that today. I mean, we have cash money and we have electronic money and everything else. But what we're saying here is that your your dollars in whether it's the paper in your pocket or the change in your cookie jar or whatever, wherever you throw your extra change or whatever, um, and, and you know whether it's certainly the electronic money in your bank, uh, you know what your bank account is. Uh, and and what's represented by your stock account and everything, you you are being attacked every day, every week, every month by inflation, which leads you from you know a long time ago, and some of you out there might be old enough to remember, leads you from ten cents Hershey bars to two dollar Hershey bars, you know, and uh, it who knows in a couple of years this could be a five dollar Hershey bar or a ten dollar Hershey bar, you know, so so you know be careful, you know, be careful, you know, in terms of preserving your wealth. Um, that's sort of the background. I've got lots more to say, but I don't want to hog the hog the the scene. I mean, uh, uh, Dan Dan Amos, as uh, as Sean said, is is the hardest working, uh, one of the hardest working you know investment analysts you're ever going to find. Uh, Dan, why don't you throw a few words in there from down your from your perch down in eastern Tennessee, which I guess you didn't get flooded as badly as other people did, but. Uh, like I, I suppose you had some rain the last week or two as well. Huh? No, we, we had some rain, and thanks for uh, for asking and throwing it over. And uh, I'll just add that, um, you know, uh, a big uh, the Fed has gotten more and more influential in the financial markets with each passing uh, wave of of uh, you know uh, market history, and it's just remarkable. You know, I started my career about almost twenty five years ago. Um, the Fed was kind of a, a sideshow, really. Um, people really focused on earnings, on cash flows, on old-fashioned valuation metrics. And this this parallel, it kind of parallels what Byron was talking about with the, the devolution of the monetary system. It used to be based on savings. You know, uh, banks would take in everyone's savings, reloan them out, et cetera. We'd, have a, we'd had a gold standard, which kept government and banking to a reasonable size relative to the economy. And with every passing cycle, we've had uh, bailouts, we've had ex deficits out of control. And as a result, the monetary system is really collateralized by treasuries. And that's why we have, um, it, it's a big unspoken uh, risk to investors at large and to the economy at large that um, that people really can't admit, and especially the Fed, because it's, it's embarrassing, but this this deficit is out of control and the real and it's a real driver infl of inflation you don't you don't see jay powell getting these questions these hard questions at his press conferences asking hey you know uh what will your uh rate policy how your will your rate policy influence the refinancing of the treasury bill market you know in about rough numbers about 70 to 80 percent of the national debt that 35 trillion that byron talked about is in t-bills 60 or 70 i believe that means not only do we have to, uh, you know, sell almost $2 trillion of new treasury T-bills a year and notes to fund the deficit, but we have to roll over uh, most of the debt load. And and the Fed, basically, with their rate policy, they determine the rate at which that rollover happens. So the Fed is the treasury's banker. It can choose to, back as ba they did back in the Volcker days in the early 80s, they, it, he basically put the squeeze on Congress and on and on the banking system to get inflation under control, and it was painful. And we thought, you know, Jay Powell, when he started this latest, latest tightening campaign, he thought maybe we'd have to go the Volcker route and it would be painful. Well, you know, now the narrative is we've had this immaculate disinflation and everything's fine. We're going to go back to 2% inflation and a soft landing. And I just think that's the odds of that are quite are quite a bit lower than the market is pricing in right now. And the reason for that is, you know, uh, a lot of stuff goes into the inflation calculations, including owner's equivalent rent. Like they ask, they survey people, what do you think you can rent your house out for? And you know, nobody knows, really. Uh, we haven't had a big inflation uh, real estate downturn. If we had had that, you know, if, if housing prices were down 10 to 20 percent from their peak, I'd be much more like, yeah, that's I think we have inflation under control. But, you know, housing prices really haven't uh, gone down. So. The way the Fed has tightened this cycle with its massive, you know, seven to eight trillion dollar balance sheet, it hasn't really shrunk its balance sheet. It pays interest on excess reserves. Um, it's been a more of a tightening uh, 
drama than a real tightening. Um, you know, because financial conditions are super easy. Corporations can borrow at very low interest rate spreads. This is nothing like the past two long Fed tightening cycles. And just tying this back to the national debt, I think the big unspoken reason why the Fed wants to get rates lower, but really can't say this out loud, is that what I said earlier with the the T bill rollover, right? Um, the the spiraling interest scenario is happening. Everyone sees it happening. And the Fed can kind of, you know, it's going up at a very sharp rate of increase. And the Fed can can basically slow that rate of increase down of the interest on the national debt by cutting rates. Now, the cost of that is it takes pressure off Congress to ever have a plan to get us back on fiscal sustainability. It takes pressure off, right? The bank, the banker just said, I'm going to make it easier on you to borrow more money. So that that's not going to stop uh, the deficit as a source of inflation, which is, a, it is a big source of inflation. People don't want to admit it. They want to blame supply chains. They want to blame OPEC, all these things. Well, you know, $2 trillion, that deficit, that the way it works its way into the monetary system is through the commercial banking system. You know, when they pay contractors, when they pay social security checks, that new money supply works its way into the system and it inflates goods and service prices. So that, that money is competing with the existing money supply that circulates all the time. And with the commercial banking, uh, you know, new new credit creation. So we have we have all the ingredients for inflation to make another to just tie this in a bow, make to make another uh, move up to call it three percent, four percent. If we go back up to that and the Fed doesn't return hawkish again, that is the ultimate bull scenario for gold. Because, you know, you could see a stampede into it, and it's still a very uh, very ignored and very quiet bull market. With that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Zach, what he sees uh, technically and regarding flows and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dan and, and Byron, too. Uh, Sean, I, I wasn't aware that we were supposed to bring props, so I may not be uh, fully prepared for that. But I will say, here we have uh, my Starbucks. And I like my coffee. Hey, cheers. Cheers. I like my coffee like the outlook for the U.S. dollar, uh, dark and bitter, uh, black. Um, <laughs> But I'm just thinking about this in, in terms of what Byron was saying. Um, uh, I think this just plain black coffee cost me three forty nine this morning, and and I don't usually do that because it's obviously probably not worth three forty nine or whatever. But you know, I was in a hurry to pick up the kids and get them to school and all of that. So uh, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. But it's uh, it, it has been interesting. I, I may be the baby here. I've only got twenty five years or twenty four years of experience in the market. Dan's got me beat by a year. I don't know, uh, Sean, Byron, you guys might might have both of us beat. Um, but but I've I've watched this phenomenon, and it, it has been very interesting to see um, just how how prices put pressure on the the normal consumer, uh, specifically on retirees. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit because my focus in the markets, uh, especially over the last 10 years or so, has been income and helping people who have built their savings, who have worked hard, who have um, put money aside for retirement, um, then to be able to generate the income from that retirement to cover your day-to-day -day expenses, to live a, a, a happy life, to be able to be generous to the causes or the people that, that you care about, and inflation really puts a damper on that uh, that type of lifestyle. Let's say that you saved up uh, enough in retirement, and you said, "Okay, I, I need to earn." Let's just say I need I need to have sixty thousand dollars because maybe you don't have to pay a mortgage or rent or whatever. Um, your house is paid off, but you need to have sixty thousand dollars of income per year to be able to do the things you want to do, to be able to get your Starbucks, to be able to uh, take your grandkids out, to be able to to go out to dinner once a week or, or whatever that would be. Well, that sixty thousand dollars right now might mean that you need seventy thousand dollars in three or four years, maybe faster than that. Uh, you might need ninety thousand dollars in a decade, uh, and that that number just keeps increasing and increasing because of this inflation issue that we're that we're talking about. So, if you've prepared and you've got a bundle of savings, and you know that you know you can make a three percent or five percent or whatever that percentage number that you you've got in your mind off of the savings that you've got, that number has to increase over time because every dollar that you earn next year, the year after the year after that, really is, is less and less. Uh, and, and so one of the things that I really focus on when it comes to income is figuring out how to grow that income over time. It's not good enough just to have the income from your savings be the number that you need. It's, it's important for that number to grow as fast or faster than the rate of inflation. 
And while we do have a lot, um, just as Dan and Byron were talking about, a lot of things to be concerned about with the national debt, with um, with the interest paid on the national debt, with the devaluation of the dollar, because we do know that the, the more trouble the U.S. is in economically and, and financially, the more pressure that puts on the U.S. dollar. But the, the, the kind of the counter to that argument is that when dollars become weaker and weaker, it takes more dollars to buy stuff. So if you own stuff instead of dollars, and by stuff, we talk about commodities that hold their value, specifically gold and silver, then that winds up being uh, a, a good hedge or sometimes even an accelerator for inflation. I don't just want you to keep up with inflation. I'd like you to beat inflation and to wind up with more spending power over time. And so uh, precious metals can be a really good way of, of not just protecting your wealth, but growing your wealth in an inflationary period. And there are there are some really good income plays that you can can tap into. Um, you know, historically, Warren Buffett has been one of the naysayers for gold and silver, saying that, you know, it's one of the only assets that you dig up out of the ground. You spend money processing it and then you bury it again in a vault or whatever, like like Byron was talking about. And he said it doesn't have any economic value. And, you know, functionally, he might be correct, but that's not the way the market has worked over the last five five thousand years. So if I'm a betting man and I am a betting man, I would say let's go with what has worked over the last five thousand years. There's no reason to, to expect that this year or this decade or this century is going to be something different than what we've seen over the last five thousand years. And precious metals do help to not just store, but also create extra value. And that extra value can actually lead to income depending on how you play it. So uh, that's my two cents or maybe one cent or 13 cents. <laughs> I can't remember which way that goes. <laughs> that's brilliant. Thank you, Zach. That's great. So gentlemen, I mean, I you know, I think you, you very well established the foundations of, of why we are such precious metal bulls at the minute, at the moment, and probably well into the future. If I can hand it back to you, just go, where, where do you think gold will be in the next six months? And again, it's incredibly hard to predict these things. Uh, but, you know, if, if we can get your outlook over the next six months and why you think it's going to be there. And Byron will lead off with you, if that's all right. Okay, well, uh, the price of gold is very dependent on, you know, what the perceptions of the of the dollar and the future of the dollar. So people look at the dollar index, you know, when the dollar goes up, gold goes down. That's, I mean, gold, dollar goes down, gold goes up. That's the basics of it, sure. Um, right now, you know, for when for the last, you know, couple, year and a half or so, uh, the, the perception of the dollar has been weakening, 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 which is why a little over a year ago, you could buy an ounce of gold. The spot price of gold about a year ago was a little around eighteen hundred bucks. You know, now that price of gold is it. it not long ago, it just barely touched twenty seven, twenty seven hundred. So in, that's that's a nine hundred dollar difference on the eighteen hundred dollar base. That's a fifty percent move in gold in a year. Uh, you know, when Zach was talking about long term preservation, if you go back twenty and twenty five years, your annualized return. If you had bought gold in 2001, 2002, something like that. Your annualized return for the last 22 years is something over 9%. Uh, that's pretty good. Go go do that in the stock market. Yeah, sure, you could have bought Nvidia and whatever, you know. But but I'm just saying, if you're just sort of playing the indexes, the last 20 some years of gold has been over 9%, um, and that's that's steady. Now, sure, you you've got to buy the gold, you've got to you know secure the gold, you hang on to it. Then you, at, at some point, you want to con you want to convert it into you know cash money that you can spend because you don't go to the supermarket and pay for your groceries with a gold coin. Although if I was the supermarket manager, I would take your gold coin and definitely make change. But that you know, but that's not how we work. Uh, but but you know, but it is doable, and there are many ways to do it. And if you're new to this game, I mean, there's so much to learn about gold. I mean, there you know, there's physical gold. There's like there's like gold that's been mined. And here it is right there, five ounces. This 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 gold was mined 100 years ago, probably from the Homestake mine in South Dakota, it turned into this this little ingot. And it's been ever since, it's like Zach said, we, we mined it out of, you know, a mile and a half beneath the earth. And, you know, we buried it, you know, we, we buried it in a steel vault down in, you know, down in a, down in a, down in a very secure bank, you know. Um, but, uh, but you can have the physical gold, you can have, you know, the electronic gold, you can, uh, gold ETFs. 
You can have gold miners, big miners, medium, little miners, explorers. You know, we're talking dreams in the ground. You know, oh, yeah, I see a brown stain on that hillside. Well, yeah, someday that brown stain will be a gold mine, but it's not it's not there yet. You know, you've got a long ways to go. So there's lots of ways to to uh, to 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 own gold. Uh, but but fundamentally, in terms of preserving wealth over time, this stuff has been around for 5000 years. You know, they say that, oh, you know, an ounce of gold you know, used to, you know, has always been able to buy a really nice men's suit. Well, I don't know. I wasn't around in the days of ancient Rome. I suppose you could have bought two or three really, really bad togas for, you know, for, for the, for that, for an ounce of gold or whatever. And if you were a Roman centurion or something, you know, they probably, you know, they paid you for, you know, winning your battle in the Colosseum or something, you know, okay, great. But, you know, that was then, this is now, you know, you know, we, we, we don't think in these terms, but I do, but looking right now and looking ahead, uh, the price of gold is uh, is going to go up. I promise you. It, it might fluctuate a little bit here. It's going up. In not too long from now, the the BRICS nations, the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and about twenty some others of the world, which if you add up the population, is something like two thirds of the people in the world. A billion and a half Chinese, a billion and a half Indians, you know, you know, 150 million Russians. Uh, you know, a couple hundred million Brazilians. Yeah. Start adding it up, and you're getting into some seriously big numbers. They're meeting uh, to come up with this new form of currency to compete against the dollar, the BRICS unit. They're going to call it a unit. And from what I have read, the unit is going to be backed, they say, by 40% gold, 40% of the values. Well, that's 40% more than the U.S. dollar is backed right now. You know, so so right away, uh, there is going to be a monetary earthquake in the world. And it really is one of those things where you could wake up and within a day or two or three, the, the world markets are going to say, whoa, what, what just happened? You know, holy smokes. I mean, mm. you know, two thirds of the world doesn't need nearly as many of those dollars to buy oil, to buy wheat, to buy soybeans, whatever. They don't need those dollars. They're going to come back to the U.S. and be inflationary. So I get it's a long way of getting into where is the price of gold going? Well, this morning it was, you know, twenty six fifty uh, per, per, per ounce. And that's the spot price before you pay the the dealer markup to actually buy something physical. But uh, I could, you know, by the end of the year, uh, I could see us, I could see us well into the 27s and 2800s uh, in six months. And this is whether Kamala wins or whether Trump wins. Uh, if Kamala wins, it's going to be a huge rise. If Trump wins, there might be a, you know, a, 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 might give him a grace period to see what he does in terms of running the U.S. government. But, uh, but I, I definitely see $3,000 gold coming and with that three thousand dollar gold, there's that there's that sucking effect of you know that the that the, the gold ETFs, the gold miners, the you know the, the the intermediates, the explorers, the juniors, you know they're they're all going to be lifted by that by that golden tide. I agree with, with Byron. Uh, there, there are many different factors that drive the gold price. Obviously, the international monetary factors that he mentioned, the BRICS, uh, you know, the Fed's policy, and uh, obviously the the election next month. You know, I agree completely that. Uh, if Trump wins, and I currently and it's currently Jim's Rickard's prediction that uh, Trump will win and pull it out, I do think there's a chance for a correction. Uh, but I would I would buy that dip because um, you know people remember back to when Trump won in in 2016 and 2017 and beyond. You know he he likes tax cuts, he likes deficits, he likes to spend heavily, and he has a different uh, idea about where that spending should be directed. You know to to bring manufacturing home, to help, uh, you know, labor, et cetera. Um, and the Fed, just knowing them and how they operate and the models they use, they're going to look at that and they're going to be like, you know what, we're a little concerned about the inflationary impact of the Trump. It's kind of funny how, you know, you probably all have read and heard that, you know, about 90% of Fed officials, maybe 95 are, are Democrats. So they're going to, they can kind of make excuses to say, oh, we're not going to worry about the deficit under the current administration, but they might actually start talking about it under Trump. So that is a scenario for, for uh, you know, a correction. And it, I don't think it'll be that uh, deep because it, and here's the most in, compelling thing in my mind about why gold and gold stocks could surge in the next six to 12 months is it's been a very quiet, orderly bull market. It is not rowdy yet. Uh, you know, we've been around, I've been around long enough to see when it gets crazy, when flows start going into ETFs and mutual funds, People just leave the valuation argument behind. They just like, I just want to buy it. They look ahead to, you know, if gold goes to 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, there, nobody in on the sell side on Wall Street is talking about those type of scenarios. But if they happen, 
you could see the majors go up multiple fold. You could see the intermediates and juniors go up 10 to 20 X. And obviously that's not a guarantee. That is a plausible scenario because when you run through the, uh, the, the reserves they have in the ground, the co the marginal cost of, of pulling it out, refining it and selling it. And you net out, you know, the, all the costs relative to that uh, in uh, revenue at a, you know, call it five, $6,000 gold price. Uh, you get earnings per share numbers that are, you know, about half of the current stock price. And the thing about bull markets is, you know, a, a new monobaric and Agnico is not going to stay at two, three times earnings, you know, uh, at the current price. What happens is the stock price goes up as fast or faster than their earnings. And with high fixed costs, when you have a surge in the price of their product, um, a lot of it falls to the bottom line. And so this is a... Quiet orderly bull market, like I said, I follow, I track uh, flows carefully, and it is shockingly uh, low, the amount of uh, capital that's flowed into gold miners. The GDX and the GDXJ ETFs are the, are the overwhelming uh, lion's share of assets in the ETF space, and it's combined only 20 billion with a B dollars versus, you know, multi-trillion dollar market caps in and funds in the in the tech world. So if people want to reallocate toward this sector, um, you know, it's it's you, you can see a lot of bids and not a lot of offers. And that's how markets get disconnected on the upside. So I'll, I'll just turn it over to Zach, see what he has. Yeah, I, I love all the stuff that you're talking about, Dan. And um, when I think about gold, I, I, let's let's step, take a step back and talk about the technology stocks that, that Dan mentioned just now. Um, a lot of times I like to talk about bubbles and when we as investors think about a bubble, we think about the bubble bursting, right? And things are sky high and, and they come down sharply. But think about this, how does a bubble get built? What, what causes any asset class to go from a normal or low priced stock or asset class all the way up to bubble mania kind of, kind of ring? And I think that's, that's really what we can focus on with gold right now. As Dan mentioned, um, investors are not heavily allocated to gold. Investment advisors, so your Merrill Lynch or your Schwab or whatever advisor that uh, Morgan Stanley, you, you might go to and say, hey, help me out with how to, to manage my retirement. Those guys are almost, almost zero exposure to gold when, when they make a recommendation uh, for how to allocate your, your assets. They might say, well, you should probably have, you know, maybe one or 2% in gold because it's kind of the thing to do, or it's, you know, it's more balanced or whatever. But none of those guys are saying you should have a significant portion of your wealth invested in gold or in silver or any other precious metal play gold miners. Um, and so as we start to see the price of gold move higher, as people become aware of this as a good hedge for inflation, as the, the whole mindset of investors shifts from hyper growth, NVIDIA, AI, all of this excitement to something that says, preserve my wealth, be careful, be, you know, be more, uh, more wise with how I'm allocating my retirement. As that mindset shifts, there's a ton of money just, and this is just retail investment. There's a ton of money that could move into uh, the gold market. And that doesn't even touch central banks like China or many other central banks across the world that are out or that are building larger and larger uh, allocations to gold. Um, and so I do think that there's that we haven't really scratched the surface yet when it comes to gold and the money that could flow into gold. And as Dan was talking about, just just the basic concept for how markets work, there are buyers and there are sellers. And if there are more buyers than there are sellers, the amount of assets or whatever that those sellers have available will de deplete very quickly because the buyers are taking that inventory, whatever is on the market. When you have fewer and fewer sellers, the only way to find more of the asset that you want to buy is to say, I will pay more. Okay, I'll pay more. Okay, I'll pay a little bit more. We've seen that in the housing market, right? There's not enough houses available for everybody. And so we're seeing home prices go higher and higher and higher because people say, I need to have some place to earn, to live. Okay, it hurts. I might not be able to go out to dinner for, you know, for a few years, but I will pay that for a house because I need it. Well, people are going to be doing the same thing with gold and say, I, okay, I'll pay a little bit more. Okay, I'll pay a little bit more. And by the way, remember what happened with NVIDIA where the stock kept going higher and higher and the, the higher it was, the more attractive it was to other investors. 
it didn't matter how much they earned, how much they earned in profit. It didn't matter what the value of the company was. It was just people saying shiny object, right? No, no pun intended with gold, but shiny <laughs> object. This thing is moving higher. I want it. Well, we haven't seen that yet with gold. It's been an orderly market. The price has been moving higher, but we haven't seen this like, oh my gosh, I need to buy gold. And when that starts to happen, the higher gold trades, the more attractive it becomes to investors and the farther we'll see that price move. Six months, it's hard to say, because like Dan said, there could be uh, many different factors affecting the short-term price of gold. But I don't think it's unreasonable to think that gold could move up to $3,800 an ounce, which is almost a 50% increase. I know that's a big number, but think about how fast NVIDIA went and doubled or went up by 50% over a few months period of time. And that was when there was excitement in the market. So the shift of expectations from this is a stodgy, somewhat interesting investment asset class to I need to have this could put the price of gold up by 50% or more in a very short amount of time. That's, that's a great observation, Zach. I really like that a lot. I, I'm going to piggyback off everything each of you have said uh, for my pick, but I'm, <clears throat> I'm still smarting from 2016 when Trump got in and gold took a nosedive because I got long like there was no tomorrow thinking, wow, I'll get ahead of this thing and, and basically got my legs taken out. Um, and, and that is my one big worry over the next six months. How is this election going to affect everything? And I think, you know, Dan, you made a great point that the, the Fed being made up of PhDs who were paid for by the Fed um, and will naturally be Democrats because of that, because the government paid for their PhDs, will, of course, jump in on the Donald's plans and uh, may, may sit there and go, yeah, you know what, maybe we'll, we'll hike a little bit and, uh, you know, and, and bother them. And funnily enough, I had the dollar index up. You know, I, I unfortunately owe our other colleague, Alan Nuckman, dinner because it did touch below 100. Uh, but we are trading at 103.23 right now, and the dollar has been rocketing over, you know, the past couple of weeks, which I don't think anybody saw uh, coming. Um, I certainly didn't. I thought it was going to head down after 100. Um, very, very interesting. But uh, for me, I'm going to go a little bit more conservative just because I think we've got a lot of bumps in here. I do think Trump will win. I think he will pull it out. Now, I, I thought for a while there we were going to be uh, hosed with Kamala. Uh, but uh, I, I think Trump will win. I think, though, um, there will be an enormous amount of pressure um, on the price of gold once he gets in again. Uh, and then after after a while, I think it'll go up. I'm going to just stay with 2800 uh, for the next six months. After that, I mean, I've said a $3,000 gold uh, you know, for a while now in the route. I think that will happen. I think you also bring up a very interesting point about market microstructure. And when people, you know, look at the gold bid offer, you know, like our good friend Rick Rule said, you want to you want to be on the bid when there's no competition, you know, and I think right now, um, you know, when you look at gold holdings, Rick Rule, our good friend, um, had, had said, you know, listen, the average allocation of gold right now is a half a percent. So, so you know, Zach, what you said about, um, you know, the Morgan Stanley guys not recommending it, that's absolutely true right now. Uh, Rick had mentioned that if if we just go back to 2%, which is the, you know, the normal holding, that's a quadrupling of the gold price from here, which is a $10,000 ounce, which, you know, I, I'm absolutely positive we'll see um, over the next, you know, five to 10 years. And uh, if we have that, that sudden, you know, um, adjustments where we have a market dislocation and the powers that be get together and then revalue. I think Jim's what's Jim's scenario, $26,000 an ounce. I think, you know, if that, if that happens, which is, uh, you know, wow. Uh, again, absolutely plausible and possible. Um, you know, gold might turn into that Veblen good, you know, where the, the laws of supply and demand invert. And as it gets more expensive, as you said, it just gets more and more attractive. Give me, give me, give me. It, you know, gold will turn into a Birkin bag and uh, everyone will want it. So uh, I just don't think that's going to happen right yet. But I wouldn't be surprised to see a $3,800 out sack. Absolutely. Um, with that, gentlemen, let's uh, let's talk about a ticker, you know, our favorite tickers right now. I think that that would be something uh, for our subscribers, new and old, uh, to, to, to like to hear about and to give them 
uh, options to explore and see what they, they'd either like to or not like to uh, join us wherever we are. So um, let, let me go back to Zach. We'll go reverse order this time. Okay. So Zach, what's your, what's your favorite pick right now? And I'll bring the chart up um, as okay. we do that. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, Wheat and Precious Metals, which is ticker WPM. It's a uh, kind of a, a diversified mining company, but they also have uh, gold and silver royalties. One of the reasons I like Wheaton is they actually have exposure to silver as well as gold. And um, Sean, you were talking about silver and being a little bit more greedy. I think um, there's an argument to be made that when... Um, when investors in general are greedy, they often go towards silver. And when investors are fearful, they go towards gold. Um, but both of them are great inflation hedges and both of them obviously will do well when uh, precious metals are in vogue, which I think we're heading into that. Uh, well, we, we definitely already are in that type of a season. Um, but we can, can can profit both from gold and silver because they do have large uh, silver um, holdings. One thing to think about, are Two real, two real quick points about uh, Wheaton. One is they pay a 1% dividend, which isn't a lot, but at least shows that they are taking their, their shareholders and they're, they're, they're actually willing to give their profit to shareholders. And I think that dividend will continue to grow as the company becomes more and more profitable. And obviously higher gold and, and silver prices will drive uh, those profits higher. The other thing to remember is that um, gold and silver miners uh, benefit not just from the profit they make from selling their, their gold and silver to the market, but also from the value of the underlying asset. So think about book value, except it's not book value, it's actually the economic value of their underground assets. So if you have a mine that has, you know, however many million ounces of gold, every dollar, let's say it has a million ounces of gold, every dollar that the, the price of gold goes higher should add about a million dollars worth of value to that company. Of course, there's costs of uh, exploring and, and producing that gold, but those costs aren't necessarily gonna go up just because the price of gold went up. So somewhere around that, that same level, you can just look at the underground reserves and, and increase the stock price by that amount uh, or the overall market cap by that amount, just because the underlying price of gold or silver moves higher. So don't, um, place a normal multiple of profits on these stocks because that doesn't really incorporate the value of the assets that are underground that will continue to increase as gold and silver prices go up. So wheat and precious metal, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Brilliant. Daniel, what do you got, pal? <laughs> yeah, uh, Barrick Gold, ticker is G-O-L-D. Uh, very easy one to remember, but uh, it's a household name. Um, it's been uh, struggling for a couple of years operationally. They had a few hiccups. Um, uh, at the at the various mines, but um, this one in particular, it owns about a two thirds stake in a joint venture with Newmont in, in the state of Nevada called Nevada Gold Mines, and this is an enormous operation. Uh, they have giant rock trucks and they consume a lot of diesel. So, uh, with the diesel price uh, kind of correcting and uh, their costs, which have surged a lot in recent years, uh, you know, decelerating. Uh, and the gold price accelerating, I don't think the estimates are high enough for this stock. You know, I looked at the quarterly estimates and look, the estimates looking out next year um, and just pulling them up now, uh, the earnings per share estimates are $1.28 here in 2024 and they're $1.78 next year. I think with the the trends that I just mentioned in their marginal economics, they uh, this estimate is way too low. And one thing that uh, we've noticed about this market, you know, I mentioned before about the Fed dominating uh, the stock price, uh, marginal stock prices. Uh, well, one other thing that you notice with every earnings season is if you see a big earnings miss or a big earnings beat uh, with a guidance increase, that those can drive you know gaps higher in in stock prices. So, uh, as Sean's showing here in this chart, you saw a gap higher in I believe it was uh, late August or late July August in this stock where they had an, a beat. And a raise, and I think they're setting up for another big beat and raise. And so, Barrett Gold is one that I could see, you know, going to uh, thirty dollars within six months. And it really all depends, going back to what I said earlier, how uh, how ruly or unruly this bull market gets. Um, there have been many times in history where Barrick and GDX, the ETF that that's popular, has gone up fifty percent in a month. I mean, when it gets uh, when you have that market dislocation where you have no incremental uh, sellers and everybody wants to pile in, you have to just raise and raise and raise that that offer. 
and that's that's when you see and there are lots of funds out there that just constantly scan the market with ai and and quants and so forth they scan the market for you know accelerating move higher moves higher in charts and they pile in so um I like the I love the fact about this stock and and the gold sector at large that it's still quite ignored. It's still a small percentage of everyone's portfolio. Yet you can, I have enough broad knowledge from from following all types of investors over the years, whether it's quants, whether it's fundamental analysis, and all these things. Um, when you have uh, everyone, you know, this sector light up as a great bullish opportunity at the same time. Uh, that's when you have these surges higher in very short periods of time. Wow. Fantastic. Okay. Barrett gold for Dan Byron. Who's your favorite? Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, you know, Zach talked about Wheaton, which is a great company. I've followed it for years. And and Dan talked about Barrick, which is a, a very well-run company. Now it didn't used to be so well-run, you know, eight, 10 years ago, uh, but they are, they really cleaned up their act. Uh, I am going to be a little more aggressive here, a little more, you know, edgy in what I'm doing here. I'm going to go with a, a company with a smaller market cap, uh, but with a, an immense upside in my humble opinion. I mean, I'm a geologist. I've been doing this for years. I've visited a couple of hundred different gold companies over the years. I mean, been on site, talked to the geos, looked at the rocks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, th this company is called Contango, C-O-N-T-A-N-G-O, C-T-G-O, Charlie Tango, Golf Oscar, C-T-G-O. Uh, when you look at the chart, you think, well, wait a minute, it's just sort of flipping around here. Yes, because this has been a development company for the last you know, couple of years uh, where they were developing a project. They've got the project up and running now. And just this summer and now this fall, they are finally in the... Uh, uh, in, in, in the in the product in the production side, and so things are doing things are going very well with with Contango. They work in Alaska, so they're a U.S. company. Uh, management is small and tight. An absolute scholar of the mining industry, Rick Van Nuyenhuis, uh, you know, runs it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Bonnie Bronfman is the head GIA. She's wonderful. Uh, they are mining a very high grade of gold ore at a place called Mancho. It's sort of like a uh, it's like a native, it's like a First Nations word, mancho. And they, they mine a very high grade of gold from the surface. So they don't have underground mining to worry about. They're mining high grade gold at the surface. And then they truck it up to the Fort Knox mine owned by Kinross, which is near Fairbanks, Alaska. So they don't even have to worry about opening a mine. They don't have to worry about permits, air permits, water permits, running a mine. Kinross process the, processes the ore uh, and you know they, they have a deal with Kinross. You know they split the they split the lucre there. Uh, but but so so they mine high grade ore. They they have somebody else process it. They get the gold bar and then you know they sell it and then they divvy up the money. Now um, in terms of what they've done so far, you know they've been paying down some debt because getting everything started. You know you have to borrow money and you you owe people this that. So they're paying all that down. Uh, and then but once once they get that behind them. Uh, this is all their money. This is all bottom line kind of money. Now, with that bottom line kind of money, they have other programs going on. They have a they have a really high grade mine that they're working to restart called Lucky Strike. You know, beautiful beautiful names for these mines in yeah. these old mining districts. Uh, and uh, you know, and that's happening. And then they just made a deal over the summer with a really with a wonderful company that uh, uh, it was called High Gold. And they, they bought what they call the Johnson Tract, which is down on the Cook Inlet of Alaska. I don't want to get all geographical and technical on you. Super high grade uh, ore deposit. This is a, this is exploration upside like you wouldn't believe. So what I like about Contango is that we are at the beginning of a production cycle and nobody has quite figured it out. I mean, when I say nobody, some of some people have, but like big market has not. There's been there's no sector rotation into Contango yet. There should be. Um, they're just at the beginning of a production cycle. They've got high grade ore. It's, it, it is very processable. Ken Ross is doing all the heavy lifting for that. It's all coming out in the in the metallurgy. It's all good. They've got exploration upside, uh, you know, with the lucky strike. And then they've got even more exploration upside with this Johnson track down in the Cook Inlet. Uh, this is this is you're not going to put everything into Contango. You're going to you're going to buy other things as well. But this is one of those hip pocket plays. You buy into it. You don't worry about it. 
you give them six months, you give them a year, you go back and you go, wow, holy smokes, look at that. Uh, it's a very well-run company with a lot of gold and, uh, and a great future. That's what I think. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> over to me. I am going to go with Avino Silver and Gold Mines. Um, like I said, everybody, I'm, I'm a bit more aggressive right now, uh, probably. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am indeed fe fearful. I'll be less fearful when uh, the Donald wins, I hope. Uh, but uh, I'm going to go for greed. I've I've liked Davino for a while, and full disclosure, I have owned it since about eighty cents. Okay, so it's it's been bobbing around, and then it's just broken out of a a pretty good consolidation range here. But um, besides the technicals that I that I really like about this, and you can see the clear uptrend there um, after uh, poor mining. And Silvercrest um, announced, well, actually, Core announced the acquisition of Silvercrest. It wasn't a merger. Um, Avino is a sitting duck. And I think this could be a very quick win because 80% of Avino shareholders are retailer, uh, are retail investors. So there's no one really that could block a takeover. Um, and I think, you know, at this price, uh, with their... Uh, all in sustaining costs projected to um, decrease over the coming years and a lot more silver production to come on um, by 2027. I like them as a takeover target. So I wouldn't be surprised in the next three to six months to see these guys gobbled up. Um, again, if you if you look at guys like Don Durrett, who's an excellent um, mining analyst over at goldstockdata.com. I really like Don's stuff. He thinks this was a potential 50 bagger, uh, 25 to 50 bagger, which which would be just amazing. I don't think we're going to get to that because I think they're going to get taken over um, a lot sooner than that would be able to happen. However, it is still a multi-bag play, even if they get taken over. With that said, gentlemen, why don't I... Um, let, let's wrap it up with like the final word. I'll give you the final word, Dan. We haven't started with you yet, so um, any final words? Uh, we'll we'll uh, let, let's see what Dan has to say. Yeah, um, just a little bit more detail on the M and A angle. Um, we've seen it actually pick up interestingly early, early in this bull market, and I think we are very early in this gold mining bull market. And uh, it didn't really, you know, I was around and following the sector very closely from call it 02 to 08. And that was a great run. But the M&A cycle didn't really pick up till there was a few big deals in 07, 08. There was a few big deals. Uh, Ken Ross bought Redback. It's in, kind of an infamous deal, actually, in, uh, in 2011, 2012. They overpaid for it. But you've seen some very savvy management teams, whether it's Alamos buying out Argonaut Gold and their Magino project at just pennies on the dollar, way less than what Magino invested into it. Um, and they're by doing that, they're sowing the seeds for massive earnings out two, three, four, five years, right? Because Magino is a great project. So Argonauts, uh, not Argonaut, but uh, Alamos AGI is another one I like. We've recommended in the past that readers of strategic intelligence know well. Um, but the my main point there is um, the whole, the, the phenomenon of them getting capital discipline and having a nasty long bear market. When you see that in any resource sector and any commodity sector, um, they're, the actions that they take at the board and management level really sets you up for big upside earning surprise when, when the commodity goes in your favor. And you've seen a lot of cost cuts, a lot of optimizing of, of balance sheets and portfolios. And Newmont's doing that now. You know, they bought Newcrest and they're selling off some of the mines they don't like to smaller intermediates. And so when you see all this circulation, recirculation of capital, when you see M&A this early, I think it makes it that much more likely that looking at three, four, five years, we will see earnings per share numbers that will people probably can't even imagine now, especially if you see gold in the three to, to $7,000 range, call it, these are just rough numbers. And when I picture that scenario and your Morgan Stanley financial advisor looking at that, like we in this business, we try to anticipate what these financial advisors will be doing in six or 12 months. That's essentially what we do in this for our readers, you know, and, and we're, so we're always looking for these small probability, but high impact type of trades. And just, I would say to wrap it all up, just try to beat the rush, you know, uh, to do your homework now, identify the companies you like and just hang on and just check in every six, 12 months and see how they're doing on their earnings and so forth. Yeah. I would just, the, the, 
parting thoughts would be um, there's a book that I'm reading called Expectations Investing, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in a, in a future call maybe. Um, but it talks about how market prices typically move and are driven by changes in expectations among investors. So it's not the fundamentals matter, absolutely matter. But the fundamentals cause those expectations to change from, from people to, to turn their attention from one area of the market to another area of the market. And I think we're at a really watershed event, uh, a really important point in history where those expectations turn from some of the glitzy areas of the market that uh, many people have been invested in to some of the more solid, very fundamentally sound areas, including precious metals. Uh, and so as those expectations shift, uh, that could be a big part of what drives uh, prices higher and creates a lot of wealth for those of us who are in this area of the market ahead of um, the coming shift. Well, I'm glad if, if you've stayed with us this long. Thank you very much for, for you know bearing up with us here. Uh, I want to get back to what I talked about at the very beginning. I mean, if we're, you know if you rewind the tape to the first comments that I made, I mean I'm I'm going to show you this is a this is a twenty dollar bill right here, and she. You know, normal $20 bill, you might have one in your pocket, might have a few of them. It's what you get at the ATM machine. I want to show you a different kind of $20. This is a this is a $20 uh, Federal Reserve note from 1914. Um, this was one of the, the, 1914, this was the first year of the Federal Reserve. Uh, and it's series 1914 and it's dated and everything else. It's, it's you know, it's obviously, it's an artifact, you know, it's a, you buy it on, you, it's, it, it's worth, something as a museum piece, basically. Uh, I would never take this to the 7-Eleven and you know, buy a Hershey bar with it or something, but, you know, but uh, uh, th this, this is a Federal Reserve note and it's got a lot of you know, writing and everything else on it. But one of the things that it says is that you know, the United States government will pay to the bearer the sum of $20. Well, what they meant in terms of the sum of $20, they'll pay you $20 of gold. And well, what was $20 of gold? back in 1914. $20 of gold back in 1914 was a $20 gold piece like this. This, this is a $20 gold, this is from 1908, but you know, but th this $20 unit, this note from 1914 would have bought this gold piece or you could have ta taken it to a, a national bank and traded in this for that and there you go. Well, to buy this thing today, to buy this $20 gold coin today, is, I mean, aside from the numismatic value, the gold alone on this thing is is, is up around the twenty six hundred dollar range. So so you need one hundred and thirty of these modern twenty dollar bills to buy this guy today. So it, now we're saying, well, that, that's been a century. I mean, a lot of things happened: World War One, World War Two, the Depression. Yeah, I get it. Okay, but uh, but we are in a we are in a in a at a point where with thirty five trillion dollars of debt, one point eight trillion dollars of national uh, you know, borrowing just to, to cover the budget for last year, uh, you know, 5% interest on that, which, you know, Dan Amos talked about earlier, uh, you know, where, where, where the curve isn't just going to start to, you know, move like this, the curve is going to start to go up, the curve is going to start to uh, get bigger, we're, we're in this, we're in this sort of uh, turn of the curve uh, point, the asymptotic uh, part, things could get really dicey, a lot faster than what you think. Uh, and it gets back to, I mentioned earlier, this whole BRICS thing, where they're going to come up with a BRICS unit, which is, you know, 40% backed by gold, which I said is 40% more than the U.S. dollar. I mean, you know, th th you know, this used to be backed by this, you know, hello, and this, this was 110 years ago. Uh, now, today, this $20 bill, it's really not backed by anything. It's backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Uh, which means that the full faith and credit of the same government that runs FEMA in North Carolina, that runs the FBI, you know, chasing down, you know, grandmas who spent 15 minutes in the U.S. Capitol, all of those sorts of things, you know, uh, the same, the same, the same government that, you know, that that has uh, that's been sponsoring this war in Ukraine that we're losing, the same government, you know, you name it, uh, you know, what what does this great wonderful government of ours do, you know, um, uh, just just asking, you know, and so. So in terms of, you know, the, the, what is the faith and credit uh, of the U.S. government? Well, I hope we restore, you know, a semblance of that faith and credit in the U.S. government. Um, you know, good luck to us all along those lines. But, but, but in terms of what you can do out there, readers, viewers, subscribers, you know, people who are just interested in this, 
you know, educate yourself. I mean, this is just an hour long, you know, video here. We can't tell you everything. We have no universal theory of everything, but, you know, we're telling you that, you know, hard assets, gold, silver, you know, energy, you know, other, other, you know, what you copper, lead, zinc, all those things. These are all very, very important in the, in the, in the next cycle of the world economy. Uh, we, you could wake up one morning and, you know, your, your, your $2 Hershey bar, you know, is, is on its way to being a $5 Hershey bar, a $10 Hershey bar. I never thought that the 10 cent Hershey bar would be a two, a $2 Hershey bar, but this is what, you know, this is what, you know, 50 or 55 years will do for you. And, uh, um, you know, where, where does it go from here? So we're, we've come full circle, at least in my view, you know, back to the beginning, uh, you know, go out and have a Hershey bar. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh boy. I'm so glad I don't live anywhere near Hershey bars. But anyway, I'll, I'll wrap it up by saying, and, and to echo, you know, I think, I, you know, of course, you you each made brilliant points, but to to kind of echo what Zach was talking about, I think we are in a on the cusp of I, I wouldn't say um, expectations differential, which which is kind of Zach's way of looking at it. I think we're on the cusp of the age of stuff again. And we're going to see a capital rotation from, like you said, from apps and stuff that doesn't really exist except they're in the ether to stuff that's in the ground, stuff that we make other stuff with. Uh, and it is, in large part, we're being led into this by Asia and everything that's going out, um, going on out in the East right now. And we, of course, try to... Um, you know, keep an eye on that as well. Obviously, I'm in Italy, so I'm a little bit closer to it. But uh, the I think the United States, in, in a lot of ways, is getting uh, dragged into the new age of stuff almost against its will. And um, it's happening, folks. Uh, the great news about that uh, is that there's still time. There's a lot of time, I think. You know, I don't, this is not going to happen overnight. I mean, I, of course, it's plausible that the, uh, the bankers get together and go, okay, we're going to revalue gold to $26,000 an ounce. It's a possibility, of course. But I I think, um, you know, for the time being, especially uh, looking at the next few months with uh, the Donald versus Kamala, um, I don't think that's going to happen. I think you've got time to look at first the four tickers we were looking at, look at your ingots, look at your, your coins, uh, look at miners, look at the indexes, all different ways you can own uh, gold and silver and by God participate because um, if you don't, it's going to uh, be one of those things that you're going to regret and probably never get a chance to take advantage of again. So please, please, please do so. And and with that, I, I guess we'll wrap it up. So gentlemen, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for your contributions. So for Byron and Dan and Zach, I'm Sean, and we will uh, catch you sometime. Thanks again for all your support. Thank you.